So I guess I'm gonna start. Everybody all ready to go? Try to put your guys screen up on the right side real quick. All right, so today we're gonna talk all about valves. Um, specifically, I think we got a decent amount of aortic stenosis this year. So I'm gonna be specifically talking about aortic regurgitation, mitral regurgitation. I'm hoping to get the mitral stenosis, but we might, might not get to it. So shout out to Danny Greedo, he's the one that asked me to do this. Um, so this is gonna be a little bit of actually still murmurs. Weirdly enough, on the board exams, I think I had a lot of murmur questions that I wasn't exactly expecting. Um, but on top of murmurs, this is also going to be uh, when do you intervene on valves? You know, when do you intervene on chronic valvular disease? And kind of what, what is really your treatment? Because I think a lot of residency is learning treatment of things. So I think I really want to go into that. So we'll start off with a question. So first question here, I'll read it, then I'll ask you guys to read the next one. Um, this is a 38-year-old female. She's evaluated for a new patient visit. She reports no symptoms. She's an avid swimmer and swims 40 laps every morning. Um, medical history is otherwise remarkable. She takes no meds. On physical exam, vital signs are, are normal. The estimated CVP is six. Cardiac exam revealed a two out of six mid-systolic murmur that is best heard at the apex and radiates toward the axilla. An injection click is not audible. The lungs are cleared all the sedation, no edema is present. So which is the most, most uh, appropriate management, cardiac MRI, TEE, TTE, or routine follow-up without uh, any imaging? And I'm gonna make a poll for this. So I'll launch the polling. Can everyone see the poll? All right, looks like you can see it. Sorry, 1840, I guess they can't really do the poll, but maybe talk amongst yourselves. If there's someone in there, maybe they can put the poll up for you guys too. I'll give it maybe 10 more seconds. I'll stop it now because it's a total even split. Uh, so what we got was 50-50 split um, for C and for D. So I think let's try to go through this. I think the first thing I want to think about when you're thinking of a valve is what kind of, um, when do I think about actually doing a TTE for a murmur that I hear? Um, and really the cutoff, it's based on a couple of things, but one of the biggest ones that you should be looking out for is how loud is the murmur? Um, and the cutoff actually for loudness of murmur. So anything that is um, less than grade two, which is a readily heard soft murmur, you just do follow up. And anything that is grade three or above, this you actually do need a TV. So she actually follow, was in this category where the grade two murmur. Um, but that's not the only indication for why we need to get a TTA. Um, there's other really indications as well. And I think when you think about indication, um, really anything that doesn't sound like a flow murmur, uh, you should be working up. And a flow murmur is typically going to be, um, usually it's gonna be two out of six or less, and it's not gonna be holosystolic um, it's going to be usually mid systolic and it's not going to have any really any extra sound with it. So if you find a murmur that has really any of those components, if that murmur is diastolic, if that murmur is continuous, um, if that murmur is greater than three out of six, if it's late or holosystolic, or if there's any extra sounds at that point, um, that's when you need to check a TTA. So for this question here, it was actually 50% got it right. It was actually day. 
And the reason was is that it didn't have any of those concerning features. It was a two out of six murmur. It was mid it was mid systolic. And it didn't have any extra sound. Whole systolic threw me off. Um, but yeah, if it's, it's if a whole systolic murmur, you have to think about MR VSD, and you really want to work that out. All right, so that is the reason why we get a TT in the first place um, for specifically for cardiac murmurs. Um, and then if we'll kind of work on this um, algorithm that I'm making here, the flow chart uh, throughout the rest of the lecture. All right, so here's where I'm going to try to use my audio for you guys. Did someone read this though? Please. You're in the CCU. The patient is a 65 year old male with a past medical history of hypertension, diabetes, and alcohol abuse, and poor dentition who comes to the hospital with pulmonary edema, shortness of breath, and soft blood pressures. He comes to you in the CCU for monitoring on a Friday. On exam, you hear the murmur noted in the video clip worse at left sternal border with radiation to the apex. It is worsened with hand grip. The patient's echo is shown to the right. His blood cultures return with strep viridens. The next day, the patient acutely worsens with flash pulmonary edema and worsening blood pressure. It goes from 100 over 40 to 95 over 20, and patient becomes progressively tachypneic and diaphoretic. Exam still with the same murmur, and now with physical exam signs shown to the right. Not our patient, but was present. What's the correct management? All right, so I'm going to play the clip for you. Hopefully, you guys can hear it. This is the video clip of the murmur. And then I'll replay um, these as well for you. So this echo, this was, these were present on admission when he came in on the Friday. And then when he got acutely worse, this is kind of what his neck showed. Um, and also what his kind of fingertips, fingertips showed as well. Uh, so the, the correct mat. So the answer choices are temporized with norepinephrine and urgent surgery. Insert an intra aortic balloon pump. Start norepinephrine and diurese the patient. Temporized with dibutamine, nitroprusside, and emergent aortic surgery. Or do you want to do an emergent balloon valvotomy? So let's uh, do this poll. We launch the polling, and we'll see what you guys think. Bit of a difficult question. So I think I'll give you guys a good amount of time for this. All right, so let me end the polling. Um, I think this is a real tough question, but I try to make this actually exactly how it was presented. This was a real patient um, that it was presented in the, in the CCU to the team. So I wanted to make it, you know, really authentic for you guys. Um, does anyone have a, does anyone know what type of murmur that we think is going on here? What type of valvular lesion that we think is going on? And I'll play this, I'll play the clip for you guys. I guess let's start. Who who uh who think it's a systolic murmur? By maybe a raise of hands. And then who thinks it's a diastolic murmur? All right. So I, I saw some hands for diastolic murmur. So yeah, this is this is a diastolic murmur. So um, let's actually talk about this murmur. Which is what is going on here? So. This is really the murmur of aortic regurgitation. So here kind of is that clip for aortic regurgitation. 
So hopefully you can hear this. I've been having some difficulty with it. Might be super soft. So it's S1, S2. So you can see that the murmur, um, you know, hits S1 and the murmur starts right at, right after S2 and it's a uh, decrescendo murmur. That's what you're worried about, a decrescendo murmur. So um, this is kind of what we see here. And you see that, you know, S1 right here. And S2 is right here. And then it's right afterwards. So why is it a decrescendo murmur? Um, so the reason why, if you think about aortic regurgitation, so uh, basically it's right at the end of systole, there's blood going back into the left ventricle. And that blood that's going back to the left ventricle is actually what's, what is what's causing the murmur. So when I think about blood flow really through a pipe, so there's a pipe here. Uh, there's, I think it's Pacelli's laws. I might be saying it wrong, but Pacelli's laws say that flow through a pipe equals um, pressure one minus pressure two over radius. So here's pressure one, which is really your aortic pressure, and then here's pressure two, which is your ventricular pressure. So as that blood starts flowing backwards at the very end of systole, there's going to start being basically equalization of pressures between pressure one in the aorta and pressure two in the left ventricle. Um, and that really that, equaliza that equalization as time goes on is gonna make the flow decrease over time, which is why it starts at the highest, because that's when your systolic pressure in the aorta is the highest and it's gonna end at the lowest, right at the end of diastole. Um, so that's kind of why it's that decrescendo murmur. So what do you guys think happens with this murmur with increased afterload? Anyone? Let's say with it, I'll kind of look at you guys with hands, what would you say? Do you think it would go up or do you think it would go down? All right, so with this murmur, you really, it's gonna be going up. And why, and why is it going up? So hand grip, it goes, it increases because you're actually increasing the pressure here that increases uh, systemic SVR, which increases the murmur. So increasing the pressure here is gonna increase your flow by Faso's laws, which is gonna increase backflow into that left ventricle. So using increased hand grip, or hand grip is really gonna increase the sound of the murmur. And then let's look at the echocardiogram as well. Um, so really we're looking at our long axis view. And the way that we get our long axis view is you know you actually take um, you take your ultrasound and you take the knob at the top and you point it up at the patient's um, right hand shoulder, uh, and then you're really trying to do a cut down the long axis of the heart. So you're going to get a couple of things in this image when you basically cut the long axis of the heart. Um, so it basically takes this image right here, and the way that we're looking at it by cutting it down the long axis is like. This. So this is kind of how it shows up on ultrasound. So here is your view uh, with the ultrasound. Here is the sound beam. And as you kind of see right in the very front, you're getting a little bit of that RV in there. And then basically behind it, you have your left atrium, LV, and aorta. So just exactly like this, aorta, LA, LV, left atrium. So there's a couple of things that we can look for here. Um, when we look at this patient uh, echocardiogram, it's not really one of the work for me. And I think that the, probably the more helpful thing is actually the flow. So systole is when you see um, these ventricular walls coming in, and then diastole is when the ventricular walls are coming out. And you can actually see that there is blood flow with Doppler going back into the LV when the patient's um, ventricular walls are moving, the ventricles are filling, which means that this is a diastolic murmur. Does anyone see any other valvular abnormalities specifically on this one? Anyone see something that just doesn't look 
right? I don't have the chat open. Uh, maybe I'll try to open that real quick. Let me play it again for you. So there is a little nubbin on the mitral valve, and there's also an abnormality on the aortic valve as well. Um, so what really happened in this case is a patient with endocarditis uh, that the patient came in with acute aortic regurgitation. Um, and then what happened, why he had acute decompensation, his blood pressure went super, super, super low, is he actually uh, completely lost one of his aortic leaflets. And these are some of the signs that were actually present on physical exam with this patient. Um, so some of these signs are not actually too sensitive specific and they really had just been signs that people have, have seen when people have really, really severe aortic regurgitation. Um, does anyone know what any of these signs are called? Just maybe just one of them, someone just shout it out or throw it in the chat or whatever. Because there's a bunch of like very French terms for all of them. <laughs> Somebody said uh, Mueller sign in here. Oh, all right, perfect. Yeah, so that's definitely one of them. Um, so this is Mueller sign right here. And Mueller sign is actually going to be pulsation of the uvula. It's kind of called the, the Mueller sign. Um, oh, someone else got another one. So this is pinky sign here, which is, um, and it's also in the second part of this video here, which is you actually see the pulsation. Um, of uh, basically your systemic pulse in the nail bed of the patient. This one is Demusay's, and this is basically a video representation of your Austin Flint murmur, uh, which was present in this case. And it's kind of confusing of like, why does it radiate to your mitral area? So here's your stethoscope. Why do you hear it at, actually at the mitral area um, with your stethoscope for these patients? And the reason why is actually that aortic jet, that diastolic aortic jet is coming in and um, the mitral valve is actually getting a little bit stenotic from it. So it's pushing on the mitral valve, the mitral valve is a little bit stenotic. And that Alston flint murmur is a diastolic rumble at the apex. So just kind of cool and something that you'll, you'll find in these patients. Honestly, these things are not super sentence specific. When you're looking at aortic regurgitation and to really know whether they have severe aortic regurgitation, the biggest, the biggest thing for these patients is what's their blood pressure. So his diastolic blood pressure was less than 50. His pulse pressure um, was really close to 80. Um, and these things together told you that when he acutely decompensated, he had acute aortic regurgitation that was causing first decreased uh, cardiac death. So, sorry, decreased flow and uh, to the um, periphery causing low blood pressure and also um, increased congestion in your LV from that back flow uh, causing the patient to have pulmonary edema, which both of them was what he had. Lastly, what is the intervention that you need to do in this case? Um, so, if you know what's AR, do we want to do this? We want to, you know, what is going to be our pressors? Um, so, if you think about norepinephrine, Norepinephrine is going to increase your SVR. It's basically like a hand grip, and that is actually going to actually worsen the aortic regurgitation. So someone had mentioned this, but we didn't end up doing this because this could actually worsen the patient's shock and um, actually have them you know, code. An intraaortic balloon pump actually works by increasing your diastolic pressure by um, expanding, but that increased diastolic pressure by expanding actually puts more pressure on the aortic valve and someone with aortic incompetence, this can also be very dangerous as well. So this wasn't right, this wasn't right. Um, you wouldn't want to do a valvotomy, that's more for a stenotic lesion that's opening up a valve um, with a balloon, like kind of just open it. So that can be for like a temporizing measure for aortic stenosis, but this is aortic regurgitation. So in reality, we had to increase his cardiac output and actually decrease his systemic 
vascular resistance to increase forward flow with nitroprusside. So that's actually what we did. And this patient was taken emergently to surgery. And in surgery, what they ended up finding was that he completely ruptured a leaflet from endocarditis of his aortic valve. He got replacement and he actually did well. And he, I, he actually recovered um, pretty well and he's still alive to this day. So this is our golden rules, I think, for treatment of valve disease that I'll go over real quick. For acute valvular disease, um, the more severe and the more rapid the valvular dysfunction is, the less likely the patient's able to compensate for it. And the only way to fix it is gonna be surgical intervention in some way, shape, or form. That's different for the treatment of chronic valvular disease where you really wanna think about surgical intervention once the disease progresses to a stage, stage where the risk of death is worse than the risk of surgery. And I think we're gonna spend the rest of the time really on chronic valvular disease. All right, anyone wanna read this one for me? A 48-year-old man is evaluated at JHAP. He has no symptoms. He is not taking any medications. On physical exam, he's afebrile. Blood pressure is 130 over 70. Pulse rate is 56 and respiration rate is 15. Cardiac exam reveals a grade three out of six diastolic murmur at the left lower sternal bo border. Echo shows a bicuspid aortic valve with severe AR, left um, ventricular ejection fraction of 60% and LV dilation of 55. Which of the following is the most appropriate management? So what do you want to do? Do you want to do an aortic valve replacement, clinical reassessment in a year, endocarditis prophylaxis, or do you want a to uh, start an ACE? All right, I got some, got a 50-50. 50-50 between aortic valve replacement and clinical reassessment in one year. So let's go through this. Um, so really when I think about um, treatment of chronic valvular disease, one of the things that I think is helpful that for any uh, chronic valvular disease, if it's severe, which you'll basically compute whether it's severe or not um, based on um, doing an echocardiogram. And usually you'll see, you know, what is the gradients across the valve, how, how small or large is the valvular regurgitation or stenosis. Those are type of things that you'll see if it's severe. Any valve that's severe by those indicators on echo and also symptomatic they need to have an intervention. The reason why, once you become sim symptomatic for most valvular lesions, your prognosis significantly decreases and you do better with uh, getting valvular surgery. So this patient wasn't symptomatic, so we, didn't, we couldn't get them there, right? The next one is if it's severe and the patient's already undergoing cardiac surgery, you're already gonna be in there. Um, so if you're already gonna be in there and you're already gonna be doing surgery on the heart, why not fix a severe valve while you're there? So if they have any of those for any valve, whether it's MS, you know, mitral regurgitation, aortic regurgitation, um, aortic stenosis, they're gonna need a surgical indication. The next ones are kind of regurgitation specific indications, and this is for um, MR and also AR. So um, for these indications, you're also going to do surgery for valve replacement, repair, or whatever, um, if they are dilated. And it depends on actually how large their ventricle is dilated. Um, if for MR, it's greater than 40 millimeters and for aortic regurgitation, it's greater than 50 millimeters. The way I kind of remember why LV dilation matters is for regurgitation. Regurgitation is usually more of a problem with preload. Um, and with higher, higher preload, that ventricle um, really wants to compensate for that you know, increased pressure and increased blood volume. And to compensate that LV will usually dilate. In, a little bit contrast aortic stenosis, which is higher pressure, is where it usually hypertrophies. Um, 
So for those specific indications, that's when you would intervene. Um, so if we look back to the question here, that's kind of why this patient does actually need an aortic valve replacement. It's because he has this LV dilation of 55 millimeters. All right, so that was that one. Um, another thing for aortic regurgitation, once their EF falls below 50%, um, they're usually going to need intervention. Now, there's going to be specific EF cutoffs really for all the valvular diseases, um, except mitral stenosis, uh, for when they're actually going to need intervention as well. Um, but they're a bit valve specific. All right. Uh, this is a pretty difficult. This is a pretty difficult one, but it teaches a very important um, knowledge nugget. Um, so, does, can anyone read this one for me? A 48-year-old man is evaluated with JHAT. He has no symptoms. He is not taking any medications. The physical exam is ephemeral. Blood pressure is 130 over 70. Pulse rate is 56. And respiratory rate is 15. Cardiac exam reveals a Greek 3 out of 6 diastolic tumor of the left lower cervical vertebra. Echo shows a bicuspid, bicuspid aortic valve with, aortic, with severe aortic regurgitation. Left ventricular ejection fracture fraction of 60 percent and a left ventricular diameter of 55 millimeters. Uh, patients went to undergo aortic valve replacement due to this chamber LV diameter of 55 and what is some of the medical planning. All right. Okay. Is it okay if I um, tell um, the team they're just in front? Hey, now, if you want to, actually, I'll mute you. All right. Uh, so yeah, is it A, biospecific aortic valve with lifetime warfarin and aspirin, B, aortic valve with short-term warfarin and aspirin, C, mechanical with long-term warfarin and aspirin, or D, mechanical with long-term DOAC and aspirin? All right, I'll give it, I'll give it up to about a minute. All right, so most people got this right. Um, does anyone want to share why they would do C? So C was the correct answer. So anyone who got it right, does anyone want to share why they thought this was the correct answer? Uh, yes. Uh, what's it called? Ashley said that she wants to share. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. <laughs> um, so she's really young at 48. Um, his fire pump said it's really working on. Um, he's young with some older valves that should probably be um, able faster to travel through years, most likely. So, therefore, like long term work for his colleagues to remember. And it's mechanical, so she would need like more money to do Did you hear that, Nick? I uh, didn't hear much. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I did hear young, though. She, uh, I, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm, so yeah, she, I'll tell you, suffice to say, she was right. <laughs> okay, that's what I figured. I knew she was yeah. right. But, um, but maybe everybody else so Navi, uh, made, Navi made fun of me for making this. Uh, he's like, why does this need to be a flowchart? I don't know. I just like flowcharts, they help me. But he made fun of me a lot. So if you like it, I hope you know, tell shut up, Navi. Shut up. But, uh, it depends, right? So the big things that you look at um, is the age of the patient uh, and when, whether they can really be on long-term anticoagulation. Um, so that's kind of the major thing. And the reason why, um, so bioprosthetic valves, they only last on average about 15 years when mecha while mechanical valves last for an entire lifetime. The problem is, is that mechanical valves need lifetime warfarin and also aspirin while bioprosthetic valves only need those two for about three months and then aspirin for the rest of their lives. So it's really those reasons that will tell you whether the patient should get a mechanical valve or the patient should get like a bioprosthetic. So if the patient's gonna be less than 50 years old, 
um, then really you think that they're going to have a longer lifetime than 15 years. Um, and they would really need to get a mechanical valve because you don't want their valve breaking down um, in their lifetime because then they have to undergo another surgery and that puts them at excess risk. On the opposite end of the spectrum, if someone's you know, greater than 70, then you know, on average, they probably only have about 15 years left. So buy a prosthetic aortic valve um, really is gonna be the way to go because they're gonna die from something else than their valvular disease before that valve breaks down. It's once they get between 50 to 70 that makes it kind of difficult. And then you look at other things. So if the patient has a really short life expectancy, you think they're gonna die pretty soon, well then it doesn't really matter if that valve breaks down in 15 years, just put a biophrostetic in. Um, if they are unable to take long-term warfarin, then you might think of a bi biophrostetic valve as, valve as well. Um, I think those are really the major things that you think about. If they have a lower risk of reoperation, bioprosthetic may be better a little bit as well. So those are the things that you look at, um, but it, it, it does take some nuance and you obviously have to talk to the patient and you know, have a informed decision and you know, kind of go back and forth with them about what their expectations are and what, what they actually wanna do um, more. And then it gets to how do we treat these? Oh, this is just a video, sorry, of a, of a uh, bioprosthetic valve that's broken down. So here is a bioprosthetic mitral valve. It's a TTE. So we're in the left, this is the left atrium right here. Here's the left ventricle. And you can see that there's a paravalvular leak. Um, basically, uh, doesn't really work that well. But you can see that there's a paravalvular leak here. And then you can also see it on 3D as well, um, where you can see there's a leak right here. Um, you can see that kind of opening up. And then you can also see that on a 3D flow as well, where there's a leak uh, coming through. So bioprosthetic valves, you know, they, they break down. They, you can get paravalvular leaks, but they can also get fibrosis, cal calcification, panis formation, all that stuff. Um, so management. So bioprosthetic valves, um, the INR goal is going to be 2.5 milligrams. 2.5, so two to three, but you only need to do this for three months, but then they need to be on lifelong aspirin. Actually, mechanical valves, any mechanical valve needs lifelong aspirin no matter what. Um, but it, whether you have to um, titrate to a higher, um, whether you have to titrate to like a higher INR goal depends on their risk factors and what type of valve they have. So if they have a mechanical aortic valve and they don't have any other VTE risk factors, um, which is like, you know, prior AF, prior atrial fibrillation, VTE, low EF, um, you can actually start them at 2.5 and do lifelong. Um, you cannot use, and I think I heard Ashley talking about this, you cannot use a DOAC. And this is a realign trial in which they actually use a DOAC and these patients actually did much worse. So you cannot use a DOAC for these patients at all. If they have a mechanical mitral, or if they have a really, a ball and cage is not really put in for aortic valve, but they have that, they still need a higher INR goal. Or if they had the presence of any other risk factors for a clot, um, then, they, then they're at three for lifelong. The other thing that's kind of nice about this chart too is for, that, for valve indications, um, anything that has an INR goal of three, you would need heparin bridging if you're taking them off of warfarin. And any of these, you do not need heparin bridging. So that, it kind of also breaks down that way um, as well, which is kind of nice. So it's like Ashley was saying, for this, for this patient, they're doing a mechanical valve because they're young. Um, the patient's 48 years old. They don't have any contraindications to warfarin. Um, and then they're going to do long-term warfarin and aspirin as well. Um, and for this patient, they would actually have an INR goal of 2.5 because they're doing an aortic valve and they also don't have any other risk factors for a clot. All right. Um, what time I have? I think I have time for this. All right, can anyone read this one for me? And let me play.
Yeah, Jet said that he wants to read it. <laughs> Thank you, Jet. No worries, buddy. You can hear me, I'm guessing. Yeah, I can hear uh, you. Great, great. 69-year-old male is evaluated in the in the AV for chest pain and shortness of breath. <laughs> Five days ago, the patient had sudden onset chest pressure that waxed and waned um, over six hours, then disappeared. Disappeared six hours ago, and he began experiencing shortness of breath while sitting on the couch. He is on HCCB and MOC for hypertension and was soon statin for hyperlipidemia. Oh. Patient appears distressed with a blood pressure of 98 over 48, pulse of 113, respiration rate of 24. Oxygen saturation is 89% on four liters of O2. Uh, jugular JVP is elevated and visible, and bilateral crackles are noted. The sound of the murmur is being played. And it will be played. He's shown to the right. Um, and the chest radiograph shows bilateral pulmonary edema. So here is the sound. I hope you guys can hear it. And I will open the poll. All right, the poll's open. Right. And I'll keep the playing. Yeah. Yeah. Four. I don't know if you guys can hear, but my computer is like literally about to broke for the break because I have so many things open. All right, so let's end this. Looks like everyone got it right. This is a pap muscle rupture. So definitely something to think about. Um, does anyone want to tell me what, what, what clue them in that's a papillary muscle rupture? Uh, yeah, John Wallace did. Thanks, John. Yeah, the first, the first image, you can see the papillary muscle floating uh, off the valve by the cord. Um, so you can see that. And then the EKG seems to show an inferior STEMI, which is concerning for RCA infarction. The RCA typically keeps a posterior papillary muscle. So that probably ruptured, causing acute MR. Perfect. Yep. And then, yeah, exactly. Um, so this was, here's a nice little, um, image of just the murmur itself that we were listening to. So if you guys remember the murmur, I'll just let you have listen. So it's going to be holosystolic like that. And I mean, basically you're just having blood rushing in um, from the ventricle into the atria through the entire entirety of systole just because there's an opening right there, right? So it's going to be that typical blowing systolic murmur. Um, does anyone know any other causes of a uh, systolic murmur other than MR? What would be on your differential here? Maybe not in this case, because I think there was other reasons why we thought it was MR. Uh, any systolic, Nick? Yeah, just any systolic murmur. All right. Uh, this is right here. AS. AS. VSD. VSD. One more. Somebody said MR. Oh, it's already on there. Somebody said TR. Yeah, TR too. Yeah, yeah, TR, MR. <laughs> Somebody said mitral valve prolapse. Yeah, I wasn't going to go into that one, but that is true. <laughs> um, 
somebody said hokum hokum perfect yeah and so what what kind of things can you do other than location <laughs> sound and valve what type of things can you do to differentiate these Uh, Ashley says Valsalva. Valsalva. All right, so Valsalva or decreasing your preload. And there's another one that can be really helpful too. Yeah, hand grip. Fred says hand grip. Hand grip. There we go. All right, uh, so I'll go through these because it's kind of hard for you guys, honestly, to talk too much on this. It's not like morning report, but. Mitral regurgitation, if you really want to think about what's going to happen with increased afterload, you're increasing pressure here. The pressure gradient going, trying to go into the aortic valve is uh, going to be higher, which is going to increase more blood going into your uh, left atrium through that incompetent mitral valve. So hand grip is going to make MR go up. VSD, same exact thing, right? You're basically increasing the pressure gradient going into the aortic valve. You have more blood that's going into your RV. Um, for your VSD, that's going to go up as well. Now, how about hokum and aortic stenosis? So we talked about earlier that um, kind of that pressure differential, um, you know, pressure one and pressure two, and anything that increases that pressure differential is going to increase the flow um, for regurgitant murmurs. But for actually uh, aortic stenosis, it's going to have really high pressures in the ventricle. Um, so actually in, increasing your hand grip is actually going to um, decrease the amount of flow across that valve. So AS and also hokum are actually going to go down um, with increased afterload. And in hokum, it kind of that increased afterload is actually going to move that, um, that gradient, that obstruction out of the way. Uh, and that's why it decreases. So preload is going to be super, super helpful. Um, so basically in increasing, sorry, decreasing your preload with a Valsalva, it's going to decrease really most of these murmurs. Anything that decreases preload is going to mostly decrease flow um, either through a stenotic valve or decrease flow through a regurgitant valve. Um, the only one that uh, can be a little bit confusing or this can really, really help with is, is hokum. So in hokum, this um, de decrease in your preload is actually going to make that ventri ventricle smaller that ventricle being smaller is going to have a harder time getting around this big old obstruction in the wall. And that's actually going to increase your murmur. So the ones that you really can't tell the difference here, um, just by a physical exam, MR and VSD can be very, very difficult just to distinguish from a physical exam because they're both holocystolic murmurs and they both are increased with uh, after, so they're both increased with afterload and they're both decreased with decreased preload. But this is actually super, super helpful for hokum. So if you're looking at all the likelihood ratios, um, when you actually start using hokum to distinguish whether it's hokum versus another systolic murmur, um, that, that, that Valsalva maneuver or really anything that increases your, that uh, decreases your preload is going to be super helpful for saying this is hokum. So Definitely doing these um, afterload and preload are really important, especially when Hokum's on your, on your differential diagnosis. All right, so that was a quick kind of review. Um, we have two more questions left. I'll read this one. Uh, so 64, five-year-old woman's evaluated during a routine exam. She's diagnosed with cardiac murmur in early adulthood. She's active, healthy, without symptoms. Takes no meds, vital signs are normal. Is graded three out of six holocystolic murmur present at the apex. Physical exam findings are otherwise unremarkable. An echo uh, demonstrates an LVF of 55%. The LV diameter is 38 millimeters. Shows that myxomatous degeneration of the mitral valve is present with severe regurgitation due to posterior leaflet prolapse. And you kind of see it here uh, in these images. This is um, a four chamber image where you can see that there's a ton of regurgitation going into your left atrium. And same thing here, you can kind of see it on the long axis, a ton of regurgitation going back into your left atrium. So the question here is, what's the next step? Do we want to do seroclinical and echo valves? Do we want to a surgical mitral valve repair, surgical mitral valve replacement, or do we want to do a transcatheter mitral valve repair? Let me open the poll.
And, you know, these are hard questions. Um, I think as interns, you probably won't know a lot of this stuff, but this is kind of stuff you learn just from being on the floors, especially cardiology, as well as, you know, eventually once you start doing mix app and studying for the boards, you'll encounter these questions a lot. So I'll give it up to about a minute. Couple more seconds. All right. So, um, I, this is a tricky one. So, we kind of talked about all any valve release and needs and needs surgery if it's severe and symptomatic or severe and already undergoing another cardiac surgery. For regurgitation specific for MR, in this case, it has to be greater than 40 millimeters. We did not hit it there, um, but a few of you guys, people got this right. And this is kind of nuanced the mitral regurgitation, where it is a class one indication to fix mitral regurgitation if, if their EF is anywhere from 30 to 60%. You're wondering, like, why would you fix it if it's 55%? Um, but the reason why. Uh, for patients with mitral regurgitation, why you fix it at 55%, because that actually really underestimates what their actual EF is, because so much of their blood is actually going into a, basically a low compliant system of their left atrium. So their EF is actually going to be much lower than 50, like much, not much lower, but definitely going to be lower than 55% because it underestimates it. Because when you're looking at someone's EF, you're not calculating how much of that blood's actually going back into the left atrium. So this is a class one indication that this patient should actually get um, a valve because their EF is 30 and 60. I think you're a little bit more aggressive with mitral regurgitation, at least from indications. I mean, you know, the LV can be a little bit less dilated than with AR. Um, and there's all these other indications if like, you know, you maybe do it if they have new ones at AFib or you may do it if they have pulmonary hypertension. I think it's probably because the prognosis of mitral regurgitation actually has a, without fixing is 50% mortality around, a lot of studies are different at five years. So it seems like you're just a little bit more aggressive, I think, with mitral regurgitation just in general. All right. And the next part, this is kind of a twofer. You do a repair replacement. Repair here is actually always preferred to replacement. Um, and the reason why it's more, there's just better mortality and basically repair, they go in, they actually clip off whatever portion, uh, whatever portion of the leaf flip is causing that, that prolapse, that mitral regurgitation, and they actually repair it versus replacement. They go in, they either put in a mechanical valve or they put in, uh, um, you know, a bioprospetic or like a mechanical valve. So I think this is always good. If you can do mitral valve repair, you should do mitral. The last one for D, doing it transcatheter, it, so the, sorry, this was not right. Doing it um, transcatheter uh, is only really done when the patient has, is not a good operant, operant candidate. And this, pa this patient is, you know, they would be, have a pretty low surgical risk. Um, so that's why that wasn't the correct one. All right, cool. And I think we are on our last question. Anyone want to, um, oh, you actually can't see this whole thing, but anyone want to read this for me while I try to fix this? I can read it. Um, patient is a 54-year-old Bengali speaking female with a past medical history. Uh, oh. Sorry. Hypertension, AFib on Coumadin, remote TB, complicated by POTS disease. Status post successful treatment with four drug therapy. Who presents to the hospital with worsening shortness of breath and scant hemoptysis? Chest X-ray shows pulmonary edema, and she has crackles on lung exam. The sound of her exam auscultation is being clear. Echo is to the right. TE is done as well, and there is no clot in the atrium. In addition to the primary valve lesion, 
uh, which is known as a severe, there's also moderate mitral regurg. Uh, what is the correct management of this patient? Percutaneous mitral balloon, commissurotomy, mitral valve replacement, aortic valve replacement. Don't, Don't worry about day. Is. Don't worry about okay. day. It's not, it's not, it's not day. <laughs> All right, I'll play the murmur for you. It's uh, super quiet. You probably can't hear it, um, but I'll just tell you that it's, it may be super quiet in real life, so maybe it just increases some authenticity. All right, let's open the poll. Can you play the murmur one more time? We could hear it. You could hear it? Okay, I, it was, I could barely hear it, so I thought you couldn't. And can you move the, the poll um, responses that you just pulled into screen? Because we're going to be able to see it. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate you enough. Right. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, here it is. All right, poll is done, and most people got it right. Here's the poll results. I think you can see them anyway. Um, so this is mitral regurgitation. Sorry, mitral stenosis. So here is just a um, just a video to go along with the sound that shows you S1 and S2. So remember, it's going to be a diastolic murmur with mitral stenosis. Um, basically, because it's during diastole, it's during filling of the LV from the, from the left atrium. Um, and the reason why there is an opening click, so S2, remember S1 uh, is going to be um, closure of the mitral valve, and S2 is going to be closure of the aortic valve. But it takes a little bit for that pressure to actually build up in your left atrium to get that, mit that stenotic mitral valve open. So that initial click is actually right when that mitral valve opens, right after the aortic valve closes. Um, so that's the initial click. And then why does it, you know, basically, why is it a crescendo murmur? And the reason why it's actually crescendo is your atrial kick. So it opens, some blood starts going in, and then you have that atrial kick and boom, it gets a little bit louder. And then um, uh, stops right at S1, which is mitral valve closure. Uh, so that's kind of the murmur itself. Um, you know, when you think of diastolic murmurs, you really have two of them, um, one being AR, the other one being mitral stenosis. One of the things I didn't know is uh, my, really a lot of the mitral area murmurs are not super, they're not always there, even if the patient has mitral regurgitation. So if you, the patient, for patients who have mitral regurgitation, um, not hearing the murmur actually only decreases it by about, your suspicion by about 20%. And mitral stenosis, it doesn't do anything. A lot of mitral stenosis is gonna be silent and you can't actually hear it at all. So not hearing that diastolic murmur does not mean that the patient doesn't have mitral stenosis. But I thought was kind of interesting because you always thought that, you know, patients will, who have this, have these valvular diseases will present um, with a murmur. And it's actually not always the case, which is kind of cool. 
So it's not you, it's, it's just medicine. You know, it's not, it's not your fault you can't hear the medicine. Um, this is just the echo, it's kind of cool, um, where this is the typical hockey puck sign, um, where you can see that this mitral valve here is not, uh, it looks like it's like a little bit tethered, and that's exactly what's actually happened. It's kind of tethered to itself. So it's not, um, it's not really moving the, the way that it should. And it creates that hockey puck stick sign right there, um, which you can see on a long axis. And then this was just the patient's four chamber. And I thought that's kind of interesting because you can see that these, the mitral valve is not opening very well. Um, and the patient uh, actually has a huge, well, a big left atria, but it's, patient actually also ended up having really severe pulmonary hypertension and their RV was actually bigger than their LV and they're, they're actually having some RV failure and a huge, huge, huge right atrium as well. I mean, the right atrium is bigger than their LV and that's never a good sign. Um, so the question is, what do we do for this? Um, and this was a tough question because most of the time, first line treatment for these patients actually going to be a PV, PMBC, so percutaneous mitral uh, balloon miserotomy. You do it percutaneously, you put a balloon in there, and basically you stretch that balloon out, and that helps the mitral valve. But the reason why we couldn't do it in this case is you cannot do if greater than moderate MR or a clot in the left atrium. So, I mean, it makes sense. You don't want to put a catheter in there if, you, if you're going to dislodge a clot and cause an emboli. And then obviously if you're opening up a valve and they already have moderate MR, the patient's MR is going to get worse. So we could not do this in this case because the patient already had moderate MR. So then you can either do um, really repair replacement. Um, so this, and this patient in real life actually ended up getting a replacement. Um, so that kind of gets us finished for our flow chart. Um, one thing I'll also bring up is that one thing that's specific for stenotic lesions is that you'll do, you actually fix stenotic lesions if they're very severe. Um, so that's usually a, if for aortic stenosis, that's a aortic valve less than 0.8. And um, I think it's less than one for mitral stenosis. And the reason why is uh, because these will progress by definite, like by definition, since the stenotic lesions will always progress where regurgitation lesions don't always. And so if it's very severe, you know that they're getting to the point where they need a valve repair and you might as well do it while they're still somewhat healthy and have good functional status. So asymptomatic and very severe stenosis, you will intervene on top of that. Mitral stenosis, it actually has to be very severe and uh, be amenable to a percutaneous balloon phlebotomy, which is you know, your first go-to, but remember you can't do it if they have moderate MR or um, a clot in the left atrium. All right, so that's pretty much it I got for you guys. I brought it right up to the hour. Just remember for review, I mean, this kind of this flow chart, remember just all valves that are severe, symptomatic, all valves that are severe and undergoing cardiac surgery, they're gonna need, um, they're gonna need they're going to need that valve replaced. Remember, there's some stenosis specific indications and there are some regurgitant specific indications. So, no stenotic lesions that are very severe need intervention, um, and regurgitation lesions that are that have an LV dilation greater than a certain point need intervention. For AR, a little bit specific for the EF, less than 50%. Be a little bit more aggressive with the MR, you can do it 30 to 60, or if they have new ones at AFib or pulmonary hypertension. Um, and then remember that first line is actually, if you can do it for MS, mitral stenosis is going to be percutaneous balloon valvotomy. Um, and then Navi loves this flow chart. Don't you, Navi? It's uh, one of my all time favorites. Yeah. Just remember, young age, uh, young age, and can they take warfarin given a mechanical valve? And then lastly, um, you guys can remember this, which is just indications for when you get up. Uh, remember this, which is your INR cutoffs um, for bi bioprosthetic or mechanical valve type. Um, and then remember, if they have mechanical valve, uh, remember the realign trial, you cannot give them a gel.
though you can give them a DOAC or a bioprosthetic if they have a concurrent indication. All right, that was a lot. But does anyone have any questions? All right. Probably something to chat. Thank you, Navi. 